Welcome everybody. I'm very excited to start another live recording of our conversation series. Our special guest is Leila Al Alami, who is the author of four novels, including The Moore's Account, which has won the American Book Award, the Arab American Book Award, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Her other novels include Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, Secret Sun, and The Other Americans, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Her new book is a work of nonfiction called Con Conditional Citizens. Leila publishes essays widely in many publications and is a professor of creative writing at the University of California at Riverside. Leila, welcome to Afikra. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to join you this morning from gloomy Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the pleasure is ours. I've been really, really excited to, to welcome you and to talk about your work. Um, one of the lines that I did not read in your bio, which is actually the first line, if uh, anyone goes to your about page on your website, which is that you were born in Rabat, Morocco, and you grew up there um, during the uh, 60s and 70s. And I'm curious what your relationship was like with um, Morocco growing up and with literature growing up. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Oh, sure. Um, so I, <laughs> it's nice to see pictures. <clears throat> I, so I was born and raised in Rabat, which is the capital of Morocco. And so when I was a child in the 70s, um, most of the books that I was exposed to really were um, children's literature produced in France. So typically you have your Tintin and Bouleville and, <laughs> and Asterix and, and so on and so forth. So that was like my very first exposure to literature. And this is why I, I've always had a, you know, genre literature is very close to my heart for that reason, because I think it's so important that uh, for children when they're exposed to literature, that there's like no judgment about how they approach book as long as they are reading. Um, and in fact, um, I grew up in a house full of books. Uh, neither of my parents went to college, but both of them were book lovers and they read constantly. And so it was very normal for me when I was a child to see my dad on one end of the sofa, my mother on the other end of the sofa, and both of them were reading. And that's really what we did as a family every night. Um, and of course, you know, I'm speaking now of a time in the late 1970s when there was really um, one state television channel, one radio channel, you know, you know, you had the movies, but there was no internet, there was no cell phone. So it was really a different era. And I think that that particular setup really did encourage family reading, like reading as a family activity, like everybody's reading, but everybody's reading together. Um, and so, you know, I, I just was doing, I was reading from a very young age, as you can see in the photo. And, um, just loved it. I loved the escape of it. And, um, and I was encouraged to do it. So it was, you know, both of those things, both being encouraged to do it, seeing it being modeled, and enjoying doing it. I enjoyed it very much. Um, but as you can see from the photo, <laughs> this particular book that I have in my hand is Le Temple du Soleil, which is in the Tintin series. Uh, and as you can see, um, these books really had uh, like this this teenage detective Tata, and then he would go on these adventures in usually very exotic places. And the way in which the Hergé, the guy who drew them, so oftentimes you know these representations of the exotic were done in extremely you know orientalist ways, extremely ex exoticizing ways. So when you're a child and you're from, you happen to be from one of these places you're not identifying with the locals or the natives in these stories, you're identifying with the hero, right? And the hero mm -hmm. is Tintin because you're out on the adventure with him and you're trying to figure out to solve the mystery. And so it was this particular reading experience that I am talking about is one that may seem strange, I think, to American readers, but will seem very familiar to readers from, for example, across the Arab world, or across indeed any formerly colonized nation, that, you know, this, this idea that literature, yes, is an escape, yes, books are wonderful, but at the same time, they are our earliest exposures to very particular uh, ways of looking at the world, very particular political situations and ways in which we imagine ourselves. And so the way that we imagine ourselves from a young age is determined by these, these earlier books. So, 
So it was an early, like it was a wonderful uh, way of growing up and loving books, but it definitely was something that left its mark on me. And it's something that it really, as I became an adult and started reading and reflecting about all of this, I really came to um, reevaluate those. those yeah. When did you first uh, consider writing to be a serious pursuit? That's something you could pursue seriously. Yeah. So I started writing. I think it's very normal when you grow up um, like loving books as much as I did that you would want to produce your own stories. So I started writing when I was a child. I started reading, you know, writing adventure stories, as you can imagine. Um, and so that, you know, occasionally in teenage years, I would write a short story here and there. But I really didn't take writing very seriously like as a vocation, as something that I wanted to do. Until I was in my late 20s or mid mid to late 20s, I was in graduate school by that point. And um, I was two years into my PhD and um, I was uh, doing a degree in linguistics and I was enjoying it very much. Um, and I found a great deal of intellectual satisfaction from it, but I wasn't really deriving much emotional satisfaction from, from, from that. And I you know, there came a moment when I thought, you know, what is going on? Why am I so unfulfilled? I've worked very hard to, <laughs> to yeah. get into this program. This stuff is extremely intellectually interesting, but there's something missing. And I just kept coming back to this desire to write stories. And more than the desire to write stories, the desire to actually share them with the world, because the two are not necessarily the same. You can, you can write for many years and write and just put them in a drawer you know yeah. you know you don't necessarily want to share it with the world and that desire to <clears throat> share it with the world really came from i think a particular frustration with this way in which people like me have been written about in fiction i just felt like there was something that was missing and i wanted my voice to be heard i wanted my stories to be heard and that's when the desire to um, become a published author uh, that's where it came from so it wasn't really I didn't I didn't get really serious about wanting to yeah. publish until I was in my mid to late 20s yeah I want to talk a little bit about before we get um, to talk about the books themselves um, I want to talk a little bit about that moment when you decided to go to, to do your graduate school studies in the states in California in 1992 and anyone who knows much about uh, California in 1992, that's when the Rodney King riots happened, the LA riots. Um, in, in April, I, I presume you arrived in the fall, so a few months later. Um, but it, right before the call, I was saying to you that it's almost like this quintessential American experience um, to see, you know, 20th century America, like... <laughs> <laughs> condensed in a single moment, that's pretty much it. Um, what was your experience? What do you remember about that moment and how did it shape the way you thought about America um, going forward? You know, it's interesting that you describe this as a quintessential American experience because um, I do think that there is something particularly American about uh, racism driven um, uprisings that periodically happen in major cities across the US. Um, <clears throat> It, is, it reminds me of a line from James Baldwin when he was writing about, uh, this is the piece where he writes about Burry and his father. Uh, and I think this must have taken place in 1942, I want to say. And there's a line in that essay where he says something like, um, to smash something is the ghetto's chronic meat. And basically the idea that when people are confined in these you know, red line districts and then there's, um, uh, like all of these, you know, things happening outside of it, including, as you see with the Rodney yeah. King beating, uh, the beating and sometimes the killing uh, of people at the hands of police, it leads to this. So basically, the first time I heard about it was, of course, on television in Morocco. And then shortly thereafter, I would say maybe a week or two after I got a letter in the mail from, <laughs> from USC yeah. uh, saying, you may have heard, you may have seen on television. Which is in Compton, for those who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> you may have seen on television that there have been these riots on television and, you know, do not be concerned. 
uh, USC has remained safe. Uh, we are, you know, um, we can guarantee the safety of our students. We take the safety of our students. You know, the usual, you know, corporate speak about safety of the students. And of course, yes, USC is an island of uh, privilege. It is a private university. You know, it costs a lot of money to attend. I was on scholarship. I just want to say that I did not pay to go to USC. But basically, it is an island of privilege within, um, you know, uh, that area, which is, of course, it was uh, South Central LA, uh, which is where the riots happened. And so I, I just didn't know what to make of the letter. And then one of my professors at the time, he found out that I was going to attend the school. He said, no, 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 you can't go. It's too violent. America is too violent and Los Angeles is too violent. Everybody has guns. Um, and you know, it's really not safe for you to go. And I think it's so funny when you think about how much the US has this image of itself as like this sort of like beacon of hope, this place of freedom, the 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 you know, the 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 home of the free, the land of the brave, and all of that. And in fact, the rest of the world really has this awareness that America is actually can be a very violent place and it might not be very safe. Um, and so that's what my, my professor was trying to warn me about. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go to school. I have to go to school. So um, I arrived. And of course, you know, things are always more nuanced and more complicated when you are like right there, as opposed to when yeah. you are looking at them from 3000 miles away. And of course, not everybody's going around carrying guns as in the popular imagination of my professor and some of my classmates uh, back in Morocco. But um, at the same time, it really was a very bizarre uh, moment of history to experience coming back to see the city slowly, like right when I arrived is when they were starting to uh, do the process of like, um, basically repainting and then re re refurbishing a lot of the buildings that had been, um, a lot of the businesses that had been damaged. It did take a while, it did take a few, a few years for the whole area to kind of uh, pick up again. But, uh, but it really was a very strange introduction to the contrasts in American culture and to the fact that you can have privilege and deprivation side by side uh, and neither side really is interacting with the other so that it's so segregated. LA is actually one of the most segregated big cities in America, right? Yeah. Um, and so you can, I mean, there's not a law that segregates it, but there is an actuality that segregates it, right? Because the university basically um, is bound by particular streets. And so, um, you know, that area is patrolled. The students really move within a, you know, a very small area. So they're really not interacting with, with the rest of the neighborhood in which they live. Yeah. The university, after the riots, basically realized that it, it couldn't really guarantee the safety of anyone if it was really so segregated from the rest of the neighborhood. So they went on a, they embarked on initiative to try and become more involved with their community. But Basically, arriving here in 92 was, was an education in this. It was an education in American um, uh, real estate segregation, if you will, like segregation yeah. in physical spaces uh, based on race uh, and the violence that can, um, that can arise out of that. Now, fast forward to 2020, the pandemic, and of course, uh, we all remember the pictures of George Floyd being uh, murdered. Um, uh, on tape, and thereafter the, the the civil rights marches across the country, and here again in LA, and only a few miles from where I live, the same thing happened. Where yeah. you have um, uh, riots in in the neighborhood, and businesses were smashed, and all of this. So the same thing happened, and it was at this a distance of almost thirty years. And yeah. part of the reason why this happens is because the fundamental problems that gave rise to what happened in nineteen ninety two are still in existence, right? So with Rodney King, it was the fact that the, the officers walked away, you know, as caught free. Yeah. And then in, in, in 2020, it's because the officer hadn't been charged yet uh, in, in the George Floyd murder. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit, maybe um, we can do this uh, a little bit in chronological order. So there are five <laughs> books I'd love to be able to talk about. It's gonna, we don't have that much time, but, um, it seems like 
you know, you'd mentioned earlier uh, that you started uh, taking to writing to try to tell tell these stories and share them with the world, right? Uh, tell stories that maybe you didn't feel like were being told, um, but also maybe that you felt you had to tell. Um, and so the, the first the the first two books are about Morocco, uh, and the third one is this like transition. <laughs> <laughs> Morocco and America. Um, but let me ask you a question about uh, Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits and Secret Sun. Do you think you could have written the, the, uh, these books out of order? You mean Secret Sun first and then Hope and Other? No, I mean, um, could those first two books have been written now? Like, could you have written, um, could you today in 2022 written these books? Or do you think those were books of you sort of reconciling your relationship to Morocco and sort of reestablishing yourself there? Well, the short answer to your question is no. And the reason is that when you, when I write a book, that book is almost like a, a, a document that represents my thinking at that particular time. So can I write, could I write a book mm -hmm. about a group of Moroccan immigrants who are crossing the Straits of Gibraltar on a lifeboat? Of course, yes, I can yeah. do that today. But it would be a very different book than Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits because Hope mm -hmm. and Other Dangerous Pursuits really is a snapshot of where I was both intellectually, but also artistically, like where I was in my journey as a writer. It is a first book. When I look at it right now, it strikes me as a first book. My skills have developed over the course of 20 years. So of course, were I to write this book today, I think it would be a very different book. I'm also older, so there's a lot of differences in the way that I approach the world now. There are certain things that might interest me to explore now that perhaps I wasn't interested in writing back then. Yeah, uh, you know, like there's all kinds of themes that I'm interested in today that I probably wasn't interested in 20 years ago. So the the premise of the book might have been the same. The execution would be completely yeah. different. And the same for Secret Son. Obviously, this one, um, this one, it was interesting because this one was part of a two book deal. So basically, when the publisher bought Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, they bought a partial of this book. Um, and so this one took me a little bit longer to write because I had just right after I published Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, I had gotten a job teaching <laughs> at the University of California, which is where I'm where I still am right now. Uh, and so that's when I was just learning to balance between teaching full time and also writing. So it, it did take a little bit longer to write. It is a book about identity, I would say. Again, identity is a theme that runs through all of my books. And if I were to write this one today, it would again be different. Um, yeah. yeah. So there's... One other theme I think that runs through all your books, and that's truth, mm -hmm. and sort of thinking about reconciling, you know, perception and mm -hmm. and reality, um, and this sort of brings us to, um, this brings us to the Moore's account. I was listening to an interview you gave, and you said um, creating an argument uh, that you, this book was sort of you creating an argument with history, uh, and in general, history is an argument of who gets to tell the story and in what way. And mm -hmm. I thought that was like a really beautiful way of um, interrogating this idea and almost interrogating the proposition of writing mm -hmm. the Moore's account. Mm -hmm. so, so for those of us, uh, those listening or on the call right now who are unaware of this book, if I can ask you to just give like a high level uh, explanation of why you wanted to write this book and why you wanted this book to exist like yes yes well this book basically the best way I can describe it is that the idea came to me and it was like a light bulb moment it was one of those moments in your life when you are absolutely sure of something within seconds of hearing it um well, in this case, within seconds of reading it, I was reading a book about Moorish Spain and I came across a mention of this Moroccan slave who was said to be the first, uh, the first Muslim slash the first black explorer of America. And I said, hang on a minute, what, what does that mean? And who is this guy and what is going on? And so I ended up looking him up and I discovered that he had been part of Cabeza de Vaca's expedition to 
directly to what is now the United States. Back then was you know, just North America. Um, and I had heard of Cabeza de Vaca, but I had never heard of this guy. And he was one of only four survivors. He had had the exact same experience as Cabeza de Vaca of, of arriving in Florida. The expedition basically fails. They do not find what they're there to find, which is gold. And they end up getting lost and they end up crossing North America for about eight years, whereupon they are found <laughs> in Texas and they are brought down to Mexico City where they are asked to give a testimony of what happened, you know, what, you know, what happened to the expedition, what happened to everybody else who was on the expedition. Why are you here when you were supposed to be over there? You know, like, so, so, you know, it's just an incredible, incredible story of adventure and the result of it. And the, re the reason that we even know about this story is that um, Cabeza de Vaca, upon uh, being rescued and being brought to Mexico City, he stays there for a couple of years and then he returns to Spain. And in 1542, he publishes an account of that incredible journey and that account is the earliest account that we have of Spanish exploration of North America. Wow. Some of the things that these survivors saw um, and some of the people that they encountered no longer exist. So we don't actually have any other testament of it than what is in Cabeza de Vaca's account. So for example, when they arrive on what is now Galveston Island in Texas, they bring with them their own diseases. And so they infect Native American tribes and pretty much entire tribes are decimated because of these diseases. So we don't actually have right now, you know, documents from those tribes because they have been decimated, but we do have Cabeza de Vaca's account of it. So that's what I mean when we, that's the earliest account that we have of exploration. And for that reason, for a number of reasons is a valuable document in itself. And it's a very small book. And I remember the very first page of that, that book says that it was a present to the King of Spain and that it was being given to him and <laughs> and that it's um you know it's it's an account of what the expedition has seen mm -hmm. and it was very clear to me just from the dedication page that cabeza de vaca was trying to convince the king that he had done a good job of the license that had been given to this expedition yeah. and so that's how you know that like you know it's 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 taken as history but it's obviously written by a man who had a very clear agenda at the time, Cabeza de Vaca was trying to get a license to become governor of Argentina. So it was in his interest to show the king that he was a good explorer and that, you know, everything that happened in the book did not display, you know, insubordination or disobeying the orders of, of the king or breaking, you know, religious rituals or getting together with native women because they were all married men. Like there's there's yeah. all kinds of things that couldn't happen, it couldn't be talked about in the book. And so when I read it, I just, I was amazed just by the adventure of it and by the kind of ways in which history to our modern eyes, especially you can see where things had been airbrushed in order to fit a particular vision. Yeah. And at the end of that book, he talks about the four survivors and he mentions this, this man, the character Mustafa al -Samuri. And he tells us that this is an Arabic speaking black man, a native of Azimur, which is a small town south of Casablanca on the Atlantic coast of Morocco. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's the biographical information we have about this man. He does, once they are found in Mexico City and they stay there two years, he goes on another expedition up north uh, in preparation for Coronado's um, expedition to New Mexico. And therefore he ends up in another book, <laughs> just a little booklet. He ends up in another book written by a friar that basically describes him in the same ways. Um, but we don't really know how this Moroccan man ended up on a Spanish expedition. Um, the Spaniards did not have trading posts. It was the Portuguese that had trading posts in, in Azamor. There was a Portuguese trading post. So clearly from Azamor, he had to have come into Portuguese hands and from the Portuguese traded to the Spaniards somehow ends up being the slave of this captain on the expedition and ends up with him on the expedition. Jeez. So... 
as soon as I read that, I thought, this is, oh my God, this is a novel. It's waiting to happen. And my first reaction was to look and see if anybody had written that novel. So, <laughs> so I went online and I kept looking and like, you know, just essentially worried that somebody had already yeah. written. This. <laughs> um, but when you approach this, you uh -huh. approach this and you say, okay, I could, um, the choice to make it a novel is interesting. Yes. Yes. And I can talk about that. Yeah, so please. when I, when I um, came across this story and I was like, this has to be a book, right? That's the light bulb yeah. moment. My yeah. first instinct was, as I said, to see if there had been another novel written about him. But the second instinct was to see, well, what else has been written about him? Has there been any nonfiction account? And as it turns out, a number of historians and anthropologists became interested in him. Now, Remember, the expedition was, the, the leaders of the expedition were Spanish gentlemen, right? They were, um, but the expedition itself had other people, including this enslaved man. And so, for example, uh, African-American historians in the late, um, to, uh, the, the late 19th century went back and looked at this and was like, hmm, what is this black man doing on this expedition and who is he? And so they became interested in him because he was from Africa and because he had been part of American history since before there was a United States. So that was their, their interest in him. So I was able to find a couple of articles by, by these historians. Then there was a book that was written by him um, that I got is out of print. Uh, it was published, I think in the 1960s. And another book more recently published out in the UK. But both of these books, to my mind, um, were making, they're written by non-Moroccans. And basically they were, because there's so little that is factual about his life. I told you what the description was in Cabeza de Vaca's account. Yeah. So what they ended up doing in the book is it was a lot of speculation. So for example, they're like, oh, he must have come from this tribe, which is below the Sahara, sub-Saharan tribe, and then brought along a particular trade route to, to Azamor. So that would be one theory. And then, you know, another book would give another theory. And the reality is that nobody knows. Nobody can be, because he is not in any of these documents other than the ones that we have from the Spaniards. And so when I saw that, I realized, you know, that that actually made a novel that much more interesting. Um, and then the other thing too, is that don't forget that he doesn't tell us, he tells us he's an Arabic speaking black man. And that I think is a really interesting turn of phrase because a lot of people, when they think about Morocco, think of it as sort of a, you know, like in very monolithic ways, which I think some of these historians that I talked about sometimes can do that. Um, Morocco is an extremely diverse country, both ethnically and linguistically and racially. So it is, you know, of course, it may have come as a shock to them that there are Black Moroccans, but there are. And, um, you know, some of them are, are speak, uh, you know, one of the one of the languages of the Amazigh people. So it's Amazigh, Tashikit, Taripit, but others speak Arabic. And, you know, it's so it can be, it, it is a very diverse place. So I don't, it doesn't take me massive reserves of imagination to figure out how this guy would have, would have ended up on, on the expedition. Yeah. So one of the things I did is basically try to work backwards from the dates of when the expedition landed and look at the sort of like the historical context of Morocco in the in the early 16th century and come up with my own version of events that to me is the most plausible way for this guy to have ended up on this expedition. And then I built a story around that. How did you how did you cook up his personality though? Like the there is some sort of um intellectual rigor that goes into figuring yes. out the dates and all that stuff, but mm -hmm. pu putting some sort of meat on the bones and saying, this is who this person was. Yeah. I mean, I think that that was the, the, it's so interesting writing a historical novel, which is something that I had not done before this book. Yeah. And so very naively when I approached him like, oh, well, but it's historical, you know, I know what the plot is. They're going to arrive. They're gonna, the expedition is going to fail. This, you know, it's all kind of outlined already. 
But actually, that was the challenge because just because you know the plot doesn't mean that you have a novel, you know, and 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 the novel has to do really with the kind of work that I had done in my other books, which is the creation of characters, which is the create putting these characters in motion and having them interact with one another and creating a story out of that. Um, so for him, you know, I, I like I said, I started out having a rough idea of when he was born. And so then I started to imagine, okay, now, you know, this guy is the early 16th century. It is Asamoah. Asamoah is a changing town. And I wanted a character who, um, because the town around him is already being encroached upon by these Portuguese, like the Portuguese literally arrive build the trading post, there's like um, uh, a conflict with obviously with the native Moroccans and they end up putting the town under vassalage, meaning that the, the town has to pay a tax every year to the Portuguese. Um, so that's like the early days of, of um, colonial expansion. And um, I wanted a character who would be sensitive to the changes around him. Uh, I wanted a character who, because this is a story that really depends on, on a retelling of history, this is someone who is very sensitive to storytelling. So then, you know, like how, what kind of stories he, is he hearing when he's growing up? Well, you hear stories from your parents. You hear stories as you're sitting around the hearth. So the mother character became important um, to write. Really, the rest of it is just the work of the imagination, meaning like the rest of his quirks and the rest of his, the fact that he has brothers and the fact that what or how he gets along with his dad, all of that uh, was completely, like it's just completely imaginary. In fact, everything about this book is, about him in this book is imaginary because remember, we do know very, very little about him. Um, and that was actually the most fun part of the book because that's the part where um, I had to be the most creative, but within the confines of what the, what the plot allowed, right? So he had to be in Asmore in the 16th century. He had to leave by 1520. You know, he had to land by a certain, uh, by a certain year. So because of that, there were constraints, but at the same time, those constraints actually allowed for more freedom. So the best way I can describe it, I, this is one example I give, is that imagine if I told you that there's a platform where you can make a, um, a very clever observation, but you're only going to get 140 characters. How would you, how would you? <laughs> imagine how would that, you platform. that. You're like, no, I can't express this extremely complex, you know, you know, thought in 140 yeah. characters, but all of us have been trained to do that because once there is a constraint, you actually have to be more creative. And yeah. so that's the same thing with this book. Like when there are a lot of constraints, but it actually forces you to be creative in order to be able to tell the story. Um, yeah. It really is, it, and it, you know, it, when you look at a book and it's a finished thing and it's, you know, it's 400 pages and it can seem a little overwhelming, but remember that this is done day by day. So yeah. it's done day by day over the course of five years. So it's not as if the character comes wholly formed in my head. Oftentimes, you know, the character might come with like, oh, I'm imagining a scene and he is sitting with his mother and she's telling him like, a, you know, a, a, a story, a bedtime story. And he's a child yeah. and he's listening to her. And so then you kind of build the scene and then you get to you kind of over the course of time, you get to know this character as a character, the same way that you would get to know a person in your life. And so after a while, you get used to them and you get to build them up. Uh, and as I said, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over the course of several years. Okay, so before we move on, there's two questions I have. Uh, the first <laughs> is, um, I feel like you were using this book to rediscover what the land that America is currently the, the nation of America currently is constituted on. It's almost like you were using this as a, a way to discover it, right? <laughs> I heard you in an interview saying you were doing all this research to figure out, to make sure that, you know, when they show up to what is now Florida, there is no orange orange trees because there were no oranges back then. Um, <laughs> and so it's almost like you were using this story as a way to be like, what is this place? What is this land of the free home of the brave? Like, what is this actual <laughs> land? What was it like before America? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's one of the things that 
that I really enjoyed about writing this historical novel is that during the writing of it, I really realized that oftentimes because a historical novel is told from, like it's it was written and published in 2014. So I wrote it between 2009 and 2014. And so it was written from the now, right? It was written from that particular year. And so as you're writing this historical novel, you're constantly making references to the present moment. Um, So for example, in the beginning of the book, when the Spaniards arrive and they land on what is an empty beach because Native Americans have sighted them uh, for arriving on the ships and have very wisely decided to to kind of step away and watch them from afar. So they land on an empty beach and they read that document, the requerimiento, which, by the way, has its roots in the Arab <laughs> in the Arab invasions of Spain. Um, but anyway, so then they they read that document and. And basically the document says that if the the natives resist that any deaths are their fault, that they are not, that the Spaniards are not liable in any way, neither religiously nor legally. And at the time that I was, you know, writing the scene in the news, um, there was this controversy about the torture memos that had reappeared in in the news that, you know, these are the memos that John Yu had written for the, George W. Bush administration basically saying that if that 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 the um, service members who were involved in enhanced air interrogation were not really um, like basically were obeying the law that there wasn't that wasn't torture that what they did wasn't torture wasn't you know a crime um, and so this is what I mean when you're writing history but like the present moment is constantly echoing what's happening in, in that history and so it's impossible to resist these parallels so in writing the book and in looking at at for example as you mentioned Florida and and the oranges and and all of that like there is so much about the world that we live in that we don't stop and and question right so you think like the orange is such an iconic uh, fruit for Florida we associate it with Florida but of course it was brought by the Spaniards um uh, you know it's it's there's so much that the Spaniards brought like you know oranges and and pigs and sheep, and these are not native to the United States, but the converse is also true. Tomatoes did not exist in the in the old world. The tomatoes are native to uh, to America and were brought to the new world. Now try to imagine Italian cuisine without tomatoes. That's something that came from, from the new world. So there's all these like sort of um, like, like even at the level of the natural world, there were changes that were happening in both in both directions. And when we look at the world the way it is now, we oftentimes don't really question the sources of what we're seeing. So that was one of the fun things about writing this book is um, every time I set up a scene, I would have to go look up the native plants of that era. Oh, can I put a eucalyptus tree here? Nope, <laughs> eucalyptus <laughs> were not, did not exist in Texas in, in, in 1536. So now I have to change that, you know, things like that. Yeah. So it was a fun, fun part of it. Okay, before we move on to the last two, uh, the last two books, I want to ask you a question. You said that, you know, you work on this, you came up with this great idea for the Moore's account. You tried to see if anyone else had written it. No one had. You started writing on it. Fast forward five years later. Was there ever a moment or even the possibility of a moment where you say, "Eh, this book is going to suck. I don't want to do this book anymore. Like, does that ever happen to somebody like you? I know you're really disciplined about uh, the way you write. Um, Do you ever hit a wall and say, you know, you crumple up the piece of paper and say, that was a good idea, but just not there. Every day. No, I mean, even scrap the whole project. I listen. First of all, there's the every day. Every day, every day you're thinking, this is genius. This is crap. This is genius. This is crap. This is and constantly all day long. So that's just what you have to deal with as you're writing your book. But there there do come moments that are really bigger crises and where you really do want to quit. And I remember I finished the first so I did multiple drafts of this book, obviously, but 
I reached a moment where I thought, okay, it is ready to send out to editors. And so my agent sent it out and um, I can't remember how many she sent it out in that first round, but basically it was like, nope, 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 nope. Wow. We don't want it. And, you know, it's like, you get it. And I remember one of them was like, oh, this book is very masculine. And I'm like, it's told from the point of view of a man. So yes, it is going to be. <laughs> I mean, oh, what an, and, what an apt observation. <laughs> sometimes, you know, when they look for reasons to reject, they just come up with, with things to say. And so some of them can be really funny, like that one. That one I laughed, honestly, when I saw that. But then I cried quite a bit because then my book had been rejected. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not publishing this one. So I went away and I cried. And um, then I actually got I got very fortunate to receive a um an artist residency in Marfa Texas and that was I remember at the time they told me I could have six weeks and I thought well I can't be away from my family for six weeks I'm just gonna do three weeks and my husband was like no you just take the six weeks we'll figure it out uh so that was a very kind thing that he did for me um and so I went away for six weeks and I just worked on the book every day that I was there and was able to you know that's when I kind of felt like okay I can see how I can rewrite and revise this this draft and at the end of that I went back home I worked some more probably it was another year before we resubmitted and then after that it sold but 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 there are there do come moments when you do feel like you know I just want to scrap it and it is so hard because Sometimes certain things should be scrapped and I can give you an example. Yeah. I, the novel that I'm working on right now is a novel that I started working on in 2014, right after the movie came. And I did 50 pages and I'm like, this isn't working. This is just, there's, it's just not working. Uh, there's, it's, it's not, there's no momentum in it. There's nothing that's actually like leading me to want to finish this for the next several years, because it is a commitment that, you know, so you have to be interested in it if you're going to work on it for several years. And um, so I set it aside and I frankly just didn't think about it. And I wrote Other Americans mm -hmm. and I wrote Conditional Citizens. And then during the pandemic, I needed a distraction. I needed a new project. And I pulled out that project those 50 pages were still crap so I tossed them but the idea was good and so I ended up picking it back up cool again. so it can happen it can happen but um, amazing okay we're running out of time so I want to talk I want to do the quick Q&A and then I think people in the chat are going to ask about the other Americans and conditional okay. citizens um, so let's do the, the rapid fire quick Q&A so the first question is <laughs> what are you reading or watching right now Okay, you're ready because this is just so like, should I start? Okay, well, I'll. Uh, <laughs> no judgment. Feel free to be. <laughs> no, because I'm just remembering about our talk in the green room. What am I reading right now? Okay, I just finished reading uh, Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis, who, okay. of course, needs no introduction. Uh, but what am I watching right now? Okay, so this is high low, right? That was the high yeah, culture. That was the high low. Like, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm watching Ozark, the final season. <laughs> That's pretty high brow. I, I thought you were. No, it's, not. it's really not. <laughs> That's That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Right. Okay. Um, uh, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Wow, shadow, like just kind of follow them. Yeah, spend a day. Um, well, there is a historical character, actually. Her name is uh, Saida al Hurra, who was governor of Tetuan. <laughs> um, basically, she was married to one of the um, pirates that had been um, operating in the Mediterranean. And I think at some point, and I don't remember the exact detail of it right at this moment, um, she becomes the governor of the city of Tetuan. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see how she was running the show. Leila, there's one way you could shadow this. Person. Yeah. <laughs> Do I sense a historical novel coming? Maybe. <laughs> just in case you want to scrap another 50 pages, just jump straight to yeah. that one. That's a yes. good idea. Yes. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Ah, you know, this is a really interesting question. I think 
the biggest thing that people misunderstand is that their agreement with me um, is coincidental uh, and not a factor. And by this, I mean that sometimes when you write an essay or you take a particular position, people get really excited. Oh, you were right. And this is great. And this is wonderful. And then you write another essay and they don't agree with what you said and they get really mad. And what they need to understand is that whether they agree or disagree is actually not, it's it's a coincidence. It is not, um, it's a coincidence to my work. If, if that makes sense. In other words, like I have to do my work the way that I see fit, the way that I think is right. And whether it is something that meets with approval or disapproval is not something that I can control and I am not writing for their approval. That makes sense. Okay, last question is, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? It's a long list, I'm sure, but if there's anyone <laughs> in or out of your profession, uh, I like how you're you're cueing me to just like avoid getting into trouble. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, well, two names that come to mind right away: uh, the late Edward Said and the late Fatima Mernissi, both of whom are just sort of um, inspirations, both for the way that they've for their work, but also for their uh, the way that they've uh, conducted themselves, also. So you know, on the public sphere, anyway, because I don't know them on a personal level. Um, cool. Okay, we got three questions. I think, uh, Joe, I think that's how you say your first name. You can correct me. Um, go ahead. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Lila and Mikey. I absolutely love the Moore's account and I'm still reading through the other ones. Uh, one thing that I would like to ask is that uh, in the, uh, with the character of uh, uh, Mustafa Al-Zamori, Estebanico, I know that you said that it was all imaginary, but did you took some inspiration from people that uh, like some historical accounts from that time, how enslaved people, especially Moroccan people and Moors, uh, uh, some uh, histories of lives of, of their lives, maybe in Spain or Portugal, or was it everything from uh, the imagination? If that yeah, makes, no, this makes is, sense. This is yeah, it's a really good question. So uh, like the character is entirely imaginary. And by that, I mean that, his life story, his birth, his parents, his family, the way that he speaks, the 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 relationships that he has with the with the other members of the expedition, you know, I created those relationships to uh, to create contrasts between them. You know, all of that is imaginary. However, what's interesting is that even if you create a character completely um, out of the imagination, you still want that character to sound and be a person of his era. So, you know, when I started working on this book, my biggest question was, well, what would a man from, you know, 16th century Morocco sound like? What are some of the things that if he were to be transplanted to the new world, what, what would be some things that would stand out to him? And conversely, what would be things that wouldn't strike him as particularly interesting? And for that question, I ended up going back to a couple of uh, sources that are Moroccan. One is Hassan el Wazan, who is also known as Leo Africanus, who was a Moroccan diplomat uh, on a mission. At the time, he was on a mission to Tunisia, and he was kidnapped and brought to Rome, uh, where he eventually ended up serving as a translator and um, then he, he was asked to write a description of Africa. And that it's not really all of Africa, it's the parts of Africa that he had seen and it's mostly like the Northern parts of the continent. And in that description, what's interesting about it is it is a 16th century man. And, you know, for example, he describes the city of Fez right before the earthquake. And I thought that that was really relevant to me and really interesting for my book. Another um, book that was also valuable was um, um, The Travels of Ibn Battuta, because he was also a contemporary. Both of these men were contemporaries of this character. So what's interesting about Ibn Battuta is because he was traveling around the world. He was visiting new lands, and there were certain things that stood out to him. So Ibn Battuta, Ibn Battuta went in the other direction. <laughs> And there were certain things that would stand out to him, like my favorite story is when he arrived in the Maldives and he was complaining because all the women were going about <laughs> bare chested. 
<laughs> and uh, but he said that the Maldivian people were very devout people and wonderful people, except for this. So, <laughs> so I, you know, that's the kind of thing that would stand out to obviously to a 16th century traveler. And so, um, you know, there were sources like that that I found to be valuable in sort of like understanding the sort of psychology of of this character, in addition to the fact that um, when I was doing my research about Spanish exploration of North America, I discovered that actually there were a number of people like Mustafa slash Estebanico who were brought from different parts of the world through their own, you know, for whatever, you know, their own reasons um, to the new world and had very, very interesting uh, lives in Mexico City. So people who were formerly enslaved, people who were mixed race, people who were from different parts of Africa and who actually ended up building lives for themselves in Mexico. And that was really interesting to me. So if you're if you're curious about them, I would suggest um, the first place to start would be this book called The Conquest of New Spain by Bernal Diaz del Castillo. It'd be a good place to start. Cool. Um, so we have two questions, two more questions, one from Elias, which I'll read, which is, um, I was wondering if you will explore Moroccan history again in your future books. <laughs> Potentially, uh, as you said, Mikey here is encouraging me to do <laughs> Sayyidah al-Hurra, maybe, who knows. The book that I'm working on right now is actually really different. It's speculative, so it's set in the future. <laughs> <laughs> not in the past, but I may return to writing. I enjoyed writing historical fiction. And if I were to write historical fiction, I, I probably um, would do it again. The, the main thing to remember is that all my books have Moroccan characters. So whether yeah. it is, regardless of where they are set, they're all about Moroccans. Um, yeah, it is possible. You know, I mean, th that person is interesting to me. She's kind of like buried somewhere here in the back of my mind. So at, at some point, I may write a book about her. So a question comes from, the next question comes from Monique. Have you considered turning the Moore's account or any of your books into films or maybe, I'm just going to add to this, or maybe series? I could imagine, um, I could imagine the other Americans uh, being turned <laughs> into a film. I could imagine uh, the Moore's account for sure being turned into a series. Have you optioned any of these? Well, they 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 have been optioned, and I've had in in very Hollywood uh, fashion. I had had very exciting periods of time when it looked like things might get made, and then things didn't get made. So for the Moore's account, it was optioned by Lionsgate, and that took about a year of. Uh, basically getting the treatment and like meeting with potential buyers and it's really interesting the whole process of like you know you're sitting in a meeting and somebody goes oh you know Idris Elba would be perfect for this we should get him on the phone and I'm sitting there and I'm like yes let's get him on the phone let's right get him on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, nothing happens, you know, because they get yeah. you know, so many projects pitched to them and I think it's very difficult like the thing I learned about Hollywood is a lot of people say a lot of nice things, but when it sure. comes to actually signing that check, like actually getting it made, then, then, you know, there's a lot of like risk assessment and something like the Moore's account is obviously an epic. And so it is set in the 16th century. And so it's going to involve costumes. It's going to involve complex sets. Uh, yeah. So, you know, in Hollywood, they hear, they hear costumes, they hear black lead, they hear, you know, none of this, you know, they, 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 they view that as being too risky and nobody wants to sign on to that. And then with the other Americans, I mean, <laughs> I've had meetings with major um, stars. And then of course, you know, their attention is like, you know, it lasts for a few weeks and then it moves on to something else. So that hasn't been that hasn't been made either. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I used to be frustrated about that. And now I'm just kind of like, I've let go. And I just figure at some point, if it gets made, great. If it doesn't get made, oh, well. Yeah. Um, well, we have run out of time. Uh, Leila, thank you so much for, for joining and for sharing your time and your wisdom. Uh, I'm going to make one last plug. If anyone wants to uh, explore an amazing blog, in addition to all the other work, I am a huge fan of Leila's blog. Um, uh, blogs, you know, underrated in 2022. 
So uh, Leila, thanks so much for making time to do this. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for tuning in. Okay, everyone, this is going to show up on YouTube and up on our podcast tomorrow. So if anyone you know missed it, who would have loved to be here, share it with them. I'm going to put a little feedback link into the chat. It takes just a second. It's a very simple question. Uh, was this good? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's the recommended answer. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. See you later. Enjoy your evening or Bye. day wherever you are. Bye.